Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. And I'm Sylvia Earle. I'm an oceanographer, a National Geographic explorer, yep, Town Park Mission Blue, and, <laughs> and I'm an ocean elder. Thank you, ocean elders, for sponsoring this program. And this is our show, Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations with the ocean community and topics of wonder and interest. We're glad to be back and hope that everyone has made some time to get outdoors. Um, I, we are happy to welcome Louise Rocha today. Louise is curator and the Follett Chair of Ichthyology at the California Academy of Sciences. And we're going to be jumping in here and encourage you to uh, put questions into the Q&A box. We'll get to as many as we can towards the end of the hour. And before we jump in and dive in with Louise, let's remind everyone that the world is what? Blue, blue, blue. Yeah. <laughs> Very aquatic. So Louise specializes in the study of ecology and evolution of the coral reef fishes. And today we're diving in on butterfly fish. So welcome, Louise. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, I am going to try to start to share the screen. But while I'm working on that, tell us about what led you to focus in on um, ichthyology and especially on the evolution of these coral reef fishes. Um, I have to go back a long time for that, but um, I think it's it's a common story between biologists, and I'm sure Sylvia's story is, is very similar. Um, but uh, uh, I've I've always been a naturalist. I grew up in a small coastal city in Brazil, and um, uh, grew up going to the ocean. I grew up having having aquaria. Um, I had an outdoor tank, I had an indoor tank um, since a very, very early age. And I was, I was about seven, eight years old. I was in third grade, I think. Um, one of my teachers realized how interested I was in, in everything that had to do with animals and more specifically in fish and said, oh, you should be a biologist. So that's when I I decided I wanted to be a biologist and that never, never left my mind. I've always snorkeled. I've, I was always interested to, to try to figure out, to see what was underwater. And uh, that picture I put there, I think this is the lowest quality picture in the whole slideshow uh, because I took it um, on a borrowed underwater camera. That's a film camera uh, in the early to mid 1990s. I think it was 19, 1995 off of my hometown. That's uh, Akitodon striatus. It's one of the species of butterfly fish that is uh, native to my hometown in Brazil and quite common there. And one of the first encounters I had with a with a butterfly fish. Looks like a pretty good picture to me. Absolutely. And a beautiful fish at that. Yes, it's a beautiful fish. And if you're a little bit patient, then you get things like that. So this is just a sample of, of, of a bunch of butterfly fish I've been photographing. They are good models. They are good models, good underwater <laughs> photography models because they're the right size. Um, so one of the one of the the things we tell people when they're trying to take good pictures underwater is that you have to get close, you have to get close, and then you have to get closer. Um, so the the this the butterfly fish in general are, they have a size that fills the frame when you're quite close to them, and uh, and then it lights them very beautifully and it brings out all of the color. So that's why most pictures you see about uh, of butterfly fish are, are beautiful like that. It's because the photographer is close to the fish and the fish is filling the the frame. Um, and then another thing I wanted to highlight with this slide here is how diverse the group is. There's a lot of different species. Um, there's, I think the next slide is, it talks about uh, uh, how, how interesting the group is. So yeah. there are 136 species in 10 genera. It's not just Ketodon. Ketodon is the genus that most people know them, which is the most diverse 187 species. They're tropical and subtropical. Um, they live in coral reefs, rocky reefs, seagrass. They're mostly in the Indo-Pacific. So we were talking before we started, we were talking about the Philippines. The Philippines, I think, is the place where they get more diverse. I think in one dive in the Philippines, you can see more species than you can see in the entire Atlantic. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, right. So you can see 20, 30 species in one dive in the Philippines. And in the Atlantic, there are only 14, in both sides of the Atlantic combined. Um, so that's what I mean about most of the species being in the Indo-Pacific. And the name Ketodon means bristletooth. So the next slide, and that oh. explains why. So that's a, a micro photography of the, the teeth of the, the butterfly fish. So the name Ketodon 
Hippodontidae means bristle tooth, and that's that's where it comes from. There's this very bristle-like teeth, very specialized in grabbing very small, tiny particles in the reef or the water column or wherever it is that they feed. If, if, if they were as big as sharks, that would look very fearsome, <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> well, it's definitely. You know, most people think that butterfly fish is, it, you know, people kind of um, think of them as the butterflies of the of the sea. You know, they kind of they're usually kind around. of a big shoal of them, kind of flitting around. At, but you know, when you look at the butterfly mouth parts, those little nectar sucking mouth parts, you can see where they have that uh, correlation. And if you're a tiny little crustacean, oh, watch out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, especially the ones that live between the rocks and the, like, yeah, like that beak there. Okay, so yeah. that is the uh, uh, long nose butterfly fish for Cipigar longibrostris, and um, that actually one of the one of the teeth images in the in the slide before was of that particular species, the one that the mm -hmm. elongated one, and uh, yeah, it specializes in sticking that yeah. long. Yeah, that's this right side one, that really long one, and it specializes in putting the mouth in really narrow places on the reef and grabbing very tiny crustaceans and other organisms that live deep in the matrix of, of the yeah, reef. It's very specialized in doing that. Yeah, it is it is kind of a they don't they seem to have a lot of them have like these little specialized adaptations that make so you can have a lot of different species, but they all seem to exploit sort of a little different niche or a different food or maybe a different time of day. So they can exist you know, together. Right. And right. it really speaks to the the complexity of coral reef systems, well, ocean systems, I suppose life, wherever you find it, even in the soil, all these micro interactions that we're just beginning to understand that each, each player affects the local chemistry. That is, we're all made of the same stuff in terms of the basic elements, but how they're put together and the release of nutrients back into the system being accepted by huh, somebody else. It's its a symphony. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, every piece has to fit together like in a, in a puzzle. And um, if anything gets out of place or knocked out, then the, the whole system is, is in jeopardy sometimes. Um, this one, I, I put this slide, the photo of this species there. It's, it's a different group of fish. They're mostly called banner, banner fish, but they're also part of the butterfly fish family. It's the genus Heniocus. And um, a lot of the species of these genus are, are widely distributed, but they are just another example of a specialized uh, butterfly fish that uh, survives. It's, it's very attached to the reef, but a lot of species in these genus are more planktivore. So they eat uh, things on the, on the plankton as opposed to inside the matrix of the reef. And that's like that resource partitioning that allows so many different species to inhabit, co-inhabit this, this very small uh, space. It, it's amazing. It's, there's 6,000 species of reef fish out there, not uh -huh. all living in the same place at the same time. Um, but in the Indo-Pacific, in the Philippines, for example, there's over 2,000 species of fish in, in the same general area. And um, they, they can't compete with each other. There's not enough resources of the same type to feed that many species. So the way they find to, to live together is by specializing into different things. So um, it, the Moorish idol is in that group too, isn't it? Right. The Moorish idol is a Zanclidae. It's a different family, very closely related to, the, to the, uh, the butterfly fish. But yes, I mean, morphologically, it's almost the same. Some people lump them together even. So yeah. Yeah. It is. It is kind of cool how you, know, you will see some fish that are very similar looking. Right. Uh, yeah. But super yeah. fit. Yeah. But and look at this. This is such a like a, a deviation from sort of that yellow, black, white. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That one is is widely distributed in the in the central South Pacific, Hemitorictis. And um, yeah, it's very unlike a butterfly fish. The first time I saw it diving, I was like, what is that? Is it really a butterfly fish? Because it's, it doesn't look like a butterfly fish at all. Even the shape is a little bit different. And then it specializes also in plankton. So the mouth is different. And I thought initially, I thought it was oh, is it a different family. It's a different genus. It's not Ketodon. It's Hemitorictis, but it is it is a, a, a butterfly fish. Huh. It's like a little opal. It is. Yeah. It's beautiful. Here, is it kind there, of more... yeah. There you are, back to the back to the uh, the typical butterfly fish model, if you will. 
yeah. uh, which is that, um, um, and this particular one has several features that many other butterfly fish share. Um, for example, almost every butterfly fish has that, that dark bar covering the eye. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of them, especially when they're small and when they're babies, they have that false eye, the spot there on the caudal, uh, the caudal, the base of the caudal fin in the species. In some species, it's in the dorsal fin. That's a false eye. So it's to confuse predators. If, if a predator wants to, to, to eat another fish, they will usually go for the head, for the eye. So if the head, uh, if the eye is is difficult to to place in a species, then it's harder for the predator to decide where to bite it. And then that split section, that split second uh, hesitation by the predator allows them to to escape. So a lot of people, when I say this, a lot of people say, "But that's not perfect. I'm still seeing the eye and the 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 false eye there. I can still tell them apart." But it does. That's the trick. It doesn't need to be perfect. Right. It doesn't need to give. It just needs to give them. Uh, like if there's a split second hesitation by the grouper that's trying to eat them, they will escape more, much more easily than if the grouper was going straight for the head. Exactly. And we see that in other animals too. You see a lot of insects that have the, the sort of the, the false eyes and butterflies. Sometimes. Yeah. Butter and butterflies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, so does it confuse ichthyologists too? Um, um, uh, I don't think so. What confuses ichthyologists a lot, we're confused in the past is that butterfly fishes, that doesn't happen a lot, but in other groups like in angelfishes and in, in uh, angelfishes is not super common either, but in brasses, for example, in parrotfish, there's a, uh, the males and females are completely different. Mm -hmm. And that has confused ichthyologists for decades. Um, there's a lot of parrotfish that have five, six different scientific names because people thought the juvenile was one thing, the female was one thing, the male was another thing, the terminal phase male was another thing. So there's like... <laughs> all kinds of, of taxonomic confusion that uh, for the most part has been solved now because we've learned when we started diving basically we've learned that those those species even though they look very different they they, they live together so they have to be male and female yeah it's it really does point to the the value of being able to to be there to really observe these animals yeah. uh in their own homes it's you know sylvia says all the time imagine if if jane goodall tried to study chimpanzees using sort of uh, basic oceanographic techniques and dragging a net around and you know getting a getting a some assemblage of of jungle creatures dumped on the on the floor and how would you really know how they interact so it's having the ability to to be there and really spend time observing is so critical yeah absolutely i've been fortunate enough here at the academy to get a lot of field time um, uh, it's not a typical academic position that we have here. We don't teach, so I have a lot of freedom to go to the field, and I do take advantage of that constantly. I'm, I'm spending so much time on the water that um, it allows us to see all kinds of interesting behaviors in addition to everything else that happens that, that we always uh, we capture one way or another. Yeah, so you're mostly observing these guys with, with uh, scuba diving and Rebreathers. Rebreathers. Rebreathers, yes. Yeah. So most of my research recently has been to explore deeper reefs, uh, the reefs that are really unknown, um, below diving depths, so below 300, 400 feet or so, using technical diving, mixed gas rebreather diving. Um, but the time we get at those depths is really short, and, but then we have to decompress for a long time. And decompression on a reef, that's why I have so many butterfly fish pictures, because there's a lot of <laughs> butterfly fish in the reef, and then I just keep photographing them, keep photographing them. Uh, this one is the raccoon butterfly fish. It's a quite common one, and I put it there just to, to highlight how, how successful some of those species are and how widely distributed they are. So this particular one is, for example, it goes from East Africa all the way to Hawaii. So it occurs in the entire Indian Ocean and half of the Pacific Ocean. And sometimes it shows up as vagrants in the Galapagos even. Um, so almost like two thirds of the earth inhabited by by this particular uh, species here and quite a few other, like another three or four butterfly fish that have a similar, very, very wide range. You think those are because they, you know, some of them are, you know, they have like a, a broader diet. So they're able to be sort of carried on a current and then maybe they get to a sea mount and then they can be there for a while and then some of them get carried on another current and they kind of distribute that way. Is that how it typically works right 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 they have a, a, a pelagic larval stage um so when they're adults they're quite fixed to the the reef where they live but when they reproduce they spend a month or two in the plankton depending on what species we're talking about and then that's when they, they disperse and they do cross vast ocean currents 
um, the, the the species in general, the ones that are super widely distributed, they are, uh, are also generalists. So they're more, yeah, in, the, the, regardless of where they land, they, they'll find a way to survive. Those are the, the ones that are really super widely distributed. And then in, in super remote places, there's always endemic species, which we're going to get to at some point. Yep. Um, but again, you see the okay, same yeah. the same motif. Yeah, that's another widely distributed one, Kitadon auriga. And again, it's the same motif, like it's the, the, the black band covering the eye and the false eye in the, the top of the, the dorsal fin in this particular case here. And I've seen, I don't have a photo, it's a shame. I spent almost the whole morning look for it as I thought I did. But um, sometimes you see a butterfly fish missing a piece of the dorsal fin or a piece of the back even that was bitten off by a, by a predator. So they took out the false eye, but the fish is still alive. So you, 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 yeah. in rare occasions, you also see that sometimes. So when you go deep, the temperature is significantly cooler than what you have at the surface or yes. within the first 10 yes. or, 20, or even 30 meters, right? So yeah. how deep and how cold can That's... these butter so-called tropical butterfly fish occupy? Right. Right, right, right. So that's a good question for this particular slide because this species this happens to be a, a, a deep water species too. Um, this is a species from Brazil, endemic to a Brazilian island called St. Paul's Rocks, which is halfway between Brazil and Africa, so maybe a third of the way between Brazil and Africa. It's about a thousand kilometers from the Brazilian shore, two thousand kilometers from Africa, but it's a tiny little island. And this particular species, Prognatolis obliquus, only lives in this island um, and only in deep reefs, so below 30 or 40 meters. So for the longest time, um, people will be only allowed to do shallow diving there. Um, and then if you go to 30 meters, you almost never see these species because it really likes the deeper the deeper reefs. So, but we didn't know that. We didn't have any data about it until about 10 years ago. Um, so this species was for a long time listed as they are, at the IUCN as critically endangered because it has a very small range and was almost never observed. Right. Uh, but when I started doing those deep dives, so we, we did a trip to the uh, St. Paul's Rocks with the Ocean X, uh, which was back then, it was still the Alusha. Um, it was 2000, it was a while ago, 2017, that we went there with them. And we did some deep dives there. The water was very cold. This picture I took at about 120 meters depth, so that's 400 yeah. some feet. Um, and the water was about 13 degrees Celsius. That's brisk. Geez, something that's brisk. Yeah, I had a, I had a five mil wetsuit. Oh, that's, that's, that's not enough. <laughs> Definitely not enough. I was cold. I was, I was, um, uh, but it's like when we get to those depths, everything is so different and so exciting. There's so much novelty that uh, you forget about the temperature. Yeah. You just concentrate on the fish. You want to document everything as soon as quickly as possible. If you, we are collecting something for, for documentation in a, in a scientific collection, we collect as, as fast as we can. And there's such a big adrenaline rush that um, you forget about the temperature. And then you only spend a short time, five, 10 minutes, and then you go back to the warm water and it's fine. But as, as the deeper you go, the colder it gets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think we got and, a little- um, here, So yeah. when we went on this trip, um, if you go to the next slide, we're gonna see a video of, the... uh, of uh, oh. me encountering them. Oh. And you notice also that the, the talk there, I have a lot of helium, I'm breathing helium on that. that, that. Yeah. So it was a distribution of ichthyologists that was rare. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, so uh, yeah, in every dive we did below 400 feet, below 120 meters or so, that, that's how abundant they were. So it's not like that they were rare and endangered, no. it's more like that they were, oops. What it, is happening here? Up in there, yeah. No, no, it happened. Like that, that, yeah, you're absolutely right. The distribution of the, the ichthyologist was not overlapping the, the distribution of the butterfly fish. <laughs> what was the name of the of the island? It's St. Paul's Rocks. Oh, St. Paul's Rock, yes. Let's see if I can get us back to where we were. They're not even, then now they're actually called Saint, the archipelago of St. Peter and St. Paul. They changed the name of it because um, now there's a permanent uh, 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 scientific base there so that Brazil can claim the 200 miles of uh, exclusive <laughs> economic zone around the island. 
but it's just a tiny little research station for four people at a time that sometimes is occupied by scientists, sometimes by uh, Navy personnel. But the Navy much prefers to put scientists there because the Chinese scientists don't cost them anything. So it's and, four, four primates and a lot of fish. Yes, exactly. Four primates and a lot of fish. I love it. Huh. I hope I get to see that place. And we it's, it's beautiful. And it's one of the, I think it's the first stop that Charles Diver did when he left uh, into his trip, uh, going south from London. The first stop he did was in St. Paul's Rock. So it's a historic place for a number of reasons. I'd love, love to go there with the submarine and be able to just spend a lot of time getting to watch those little guys in action. Exactly, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of deep water in the, the places at around the depth where they like uh, uh, between 400 and 500 feet, so 120 to 150 meters depth. And then it's completely unexplored. Uh, we just did eight dives when I mean, we were there, nine dives, so it's not near enough to, to learn a lot about it. As they say, the deeper you go, the less, less we, we know. know. The more new exactly. discoveries we find. Yeah. Exactly. And this particular zone, it, it, it's really unknown because when, when people have access to submarines in general, they go deeper than that. I know. It's and that divers, image. yeah. And Why divers I... only explore the, the top 30 to 50 meters, and then submarines are be usually below 200. So this zone between 50 and 200 meters kind of remained very, very understudied and unknown. Twilight zone in more ways than one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the music. So I think we've got our got our little fishes back now. Nice. Yeah, so that one, we also, it's another one that we talked about before we started, right? Was it, everybody identified it as a baby immediately without even knowing what species it is. Amazing. You can just can see it has a little baby face too. Yeah, so it has the little baby face. The big eye, I think, is what caught everybody's attention. The ratio to eye to 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 body size usually tells, it's the tell off of what. Um, uh, it does look petite. Is yeah. It, yeah. Back. Yeah. yeah. Is, he, is he like the size of a? quarter the size it's of the a... size of a quarter yeah Probably, maybe a little bit smaller yeah Whoa. you can see that like this this coral is a coral that has very small polyps and there were tiny polyps there so i took this picture about a month ago in the maldives and um um uh, I, I spent a long time trying to take it because i had never photographed this particular species as a baby like this i have quite a few of the adults um but not the baby and this is one of those species that heavily heavily relies on live coral to survive. So the whole background here is a healthy colony of Acropora um, that everybody knows is declining a lot because of climate change. Um, luckily for this fish there, um, there was no bleaching going on in the Maldives at the time, but when there's bleaching and, and that is followed by, by mass color mortality, um, a lot of butterfly fish suffer. Um, there's a lot of butterfly fish that depend on live coral, unlike other fish. Most fish on the reef I would say don't really depend on the live coral. I mean, they still depend on the coral because the coral builds their habitat, mm. but they don't feed on the live coral. And did that, that that species prior to that and this particular one here, um, they both depend on live coral. If there's no live healthy coral where they are, they can't survive because that's the only thing they eat. Poor guys. Hmm. Well, it's again, the symbiotic, symbiotic relationship it's likely that they produce nutrients that are vital to whatever it is that makes the coral right. thrive. Right, right, right. And ties together. Yeah. So since we started the the going into the the diet specializations and the the more the, the ecology of the group, this one is a really interesting species and quite unique also in terms of specialization. It's a uh, John Randalia nigri rostris. From the tropical eastern pacific and it becomes really abundant in in tropical east pacific islands so i took this picture in the isla del coco national park in costa rica which is a place where it's known for shark aggregations and if you go to the next photo you see why it's it's so specialized so that's a hammerhead shark that's very common in, in coco's island and um uh, uh, this is a female that's that big black kind of scar looking thing under its dorsal fin it is a scar it's a mating scar so that when they mate, the males, they bite the side of the female to attach yeah. to it. And then they mate and then they, they they split off and then the females become pregnant and they go to breeding sites and so on. But um, 
sometimes those those scars they get infected there's a lot of dead skin there so when they come close to the reef in Cocos Island they go specifically looking for those butterfly fish um uh, they organize the butterfly fish organize themselves in cleaning stations and when the 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 the, the hammerheads come nearby they they get off the reef they go towards the shark and then they pick on the they remove the dead skin if there's any parasites they eat the parasites off so they specialize in cleaning hammerhead sharks which is a, a very specialized role for a, a butterfly little fish. little uh, exfoliation spa day there exactly the... <laughs> <laughs> but again the, the connections without the hammerheads these little guys are deprived of of breakfast lunch and dinner yeah really yeah cool. and and yeah, yeah. And the hammerheads bring another thing that's very important to reefs too. So reefs, in general, they they grow in in waters that are very clear. That's why we take these like really nice, beautiful underwater photographs because the water is very clear. Um, but the water being clear also means that the water is sporing nutrients. There's not a nutrient, not a lot of nutrients in the water, so it's hard to, for the coral to survive without nutrients. And one of the, the the big importations of nutrients that comes into the coral reefs is from fish that feed in the pelagic realm and then poop, basically fertilize the reef. Then this, this is what those sharks do. They feed in the pelagic in the open ocean. And then when they come to the reef to be cleaned by the, the butterfly fish, they when they poop there, their their nutrients are brought into the reef and then they bring nutrients into the reef. It helps the phytoplankton, which help the zooplankton, and the circle goes around, around and around. around. <laughs> exactly. No yeah. waste. Yeah. So talking a little bit about their social structure, it's also very diverse. They they organize themselves sometimes in big schools. Um, this this guy here is a uh, uh, Chitodon Saint Helena, which is an endemic. It's one of those fourteen Atlantic species. It's endemic to. St. Helena and Ascension Island in the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that in Ascension, there's only a few of them, but in St. Helena, there's these schools that can get to thousands of them. So I, I was in St. Helena earlier this year, and I took this photo there. Are they both hope spots now, too? Yes. Yeah, excellent. They're, they're hope spots. We should look at, at uh, St. Paul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. St. Paul is also protected in Brazil now. It's, it's a marine protected area. Um, it's a really nice spot there and, and very, very far away from shore. So the diving there is spectacular. Should be protected. It should be. Yeah. 200 miles out. Yeah. So um, uh, butterfly fish are also known for organizing pairs like this. Um, this uh, uh, they Sometimes they, they're uh, really monogamous. Um, so they never mate outside their pair. They, form, they bond a pair. Uh, they bond to each other and they swim around together like this. Whenever you see one, you see the other. Um, they have a very unique individual marker. So a scientist that's followed them around and looking at their behavior, they'll know which pair that is. And they don't go very far from the reef. So we know really well that those pairs are super stable until one of them dies. So if one of them dies for whatever reason, then they'll mate with another one. But usually throughout their life, they stay with the same um, uh, with the same pair. So some are like big schools, like the St. Helena one. Some's like like this one. They form the pairs and they stay together. And for others, it's flexible. In some places, you find them as pairs. Other places are schools. Um, but it's it's super interesting also uh, in terms of mating systems. Yeah. Within the schools, are there mated pairs? Um, I don't think that... I don't know. Um, I was going to say no, but I don't think anybody uh, has looked at that. I think the few studies that did, it seems like they spawn in group. So a lot of fish, sometimes in the reef, you see the whole school, like groupers. There's yeah. usually a bunch of males and one female, and they all spawn together. Um, with the butterfly fish, when they organize themselves in schools, they usually do like that. They spawn in, the, the whole group spawns, and then all of the gametes kind of mix together in the water column. Just wondered, because the pair of fidelity in, in the butterfly fishes is... is it's kind of special. It's not unique. I mean, there are other fish that pair up, but in one family to have the combination of group spawning and fidelity is is interesting. I've just wondered if if there are within the group, within these schools, there are associations that we have yet to tune into. Yeah, I think, I mean, it might be. I don't think anybody... Uh... 
I don't think anybody looked at it in that much detail. I think there's a lot of studies that went in into studying how stable the pairs are, and in some species it, they last until the, the one of them dies. Um, but I don't think there were many studies uh, done in the uh, uh, like to see if there's stable pairs within the groups. That's a really good question. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll poke a student to try to look at that. Yes, we can <laughs> yeah, do that. yeah, yeah. Merciful, so we can spend a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So this is an interesting, an interesting photo that also uh, relates to uh, uh, both pair stability. So this is another species that pairs, but also kind of to their evolution. Um, so these these are actually two different species. Really? That are That's paired and mated together. They look very much alike, so but if you look very closely, the one on the top has a, a yellow kind of mark in the caudal peduncle. Huh? The one at the bottom, it that doesn't have that yellow mark in the, the base of the tail there. Then right. the, the black mark on the top of the body is bigger on the, the top species. And the, the bottom one, the, the, the black is, is smaller. The bottom one, there's more orange on the body. So there's these subtle differences like that. And um, the bottom species is the Pacific Ocean species. That's Ketodon lunulatus. And it's distributed from the Philippines all the way out to French Polynesia, uh, South Central South Pacific, and the top one is Chitodon trifasciatus, the Indian Ocean one that is from the Philippines and Indonesia all the way to East Africa. But wow. then there's a few areas where they overlap, and this is in Bali in Indonesia. That's one of the areas where they overlap, and they they look so close to each other that sometimes they don't recognize themselves as different species, and they <laughs> mate together and they 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 spawn hybrids. Wow, uh, there is oh, some. Yeah. So exchange how... of genetic material between them in those areas of overlap. But if you go to places like the Maldives, which is right in the middle of the Indian Ocean, you only see the top form there, which is the one with the orange in the tail. Yep. And mm -hmm. if you go to the Pacific, you only see the bottom form. But any if you're in, the, in between, like Indonesia especially, then you see both forms. And sometimes you see both forms pairing together. Wow. Well, how so accommodating of them to pose for you like this. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that one was luck. That one was luck. Um, because I was trying to photograph the pair. I wasn't trying to photograph the pair with the different species. And I actually only realized they were it was a pair of different species when I looked at the photo after I <laughs> see after I looked at it in the computer screen. I was like, oh, I was going for one thing and I got another one, and that it was even better. Because I was just yeah. trying, trying to photograph the pair like that. I thought it was luck plus remarkable skill. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> This is a beautiful, uh, beautiful individual oh, here. Maybe, maybe this is my favorite, favorite, favorite because of having encountered them in Easter Island years ago. Right. Charming in their attitude. Yeah. So they are they are an amazing little fish, and and uh, it's just to contrast. So that there's some species that are, are almost global distribution. There's some like these that are endemic to very small locate very small remote locations. This one is, is endemic to Easter Island, Ketodon litus. And it's not as colorful as the other one, but at uh, the other ones, but I think it has its has its charm. It has its elegance. Um and then it, it does it forms those big schools and also feeds on plankton. And uh, it's it's very common in Easter Island. It's a beautiful yeah. fish. Tippy tippy. Tippy tippy, yeah. but it doesn't have the eye stripe, does it? No, but it no, has... this one doesn't have the eye stripe. That's a good observation. There's a few sp species that that escape that rule this is another this is one of them and it, it I it's I possible i don't know but it, in the easter island is the diversity there is so small and there's no big grouper it's so remote so isolated there's not many predators there are no there's no snappers so there might be some sort of combination between being very remote and the relief from predation that allows them to to become these interesting weird colors yeah he, the, the, just the eye of it kind of reminds me of, of some of the moai on the islands hmm. and the, eye, the ones that have the eyes, it looks exactly like this fish. Big, right. eye. Big eye looking out. It looks like they're all dressed up, ready to go to Wall Street. Yeah. <laughs> so you said this was your favorite. So I think the next five are my top five favorites. Because everybody oh, asks me, what are your favorite? What yeah, if I was going to ask you, what, what are, are your favorite, favorite fish? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so this one is Ketodon Tinkeri. It's it's mostly found in Hawaii and some other places in the Central Pacific, but it's mostly of Hawaii distribution. And it's another one of those deep, uh, deep reef species. I took this photo at about 35 meters depth, which is in wow. general the shallowest you're going to find them. They're more common uh, if you go a little bit deeper. 
Um, and I took this photo in Johnston Atoll, which is another place where they, they occur. Such a beautiful fish. And this yeah. one's got a yellow eye stripe. Yeah. Ah, well, that's intriguing. I yeah. wonder why. Yeah, maybe because it's deep, it doesn't look yellow. Yeah. Right. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of color things going on in the deep reef that um, uh, I, I still have to crack, figure out why that happens. That's another one of my favorites. So I think there's going to be, after this one, it's going to be a series of species uh, from the Red Sea. And the Red Sea, there, there's something special about the Red Sea. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I love that place. The reefs there look prettier to me. The species there look prettier to me. So that's another Red Sea species right here, Chitonum palsifaciatus. And I think it's just absolutely beautiful. Red is not a very common color in, in uh, mm -hmm. butterfly fish. There's a lot of yellow butterfly fish, blue um, uh, and white, but not red. So this is a really mm -hmm. uncommon color for, for butterfly fish. And, and for that reason, one of, my, one of my favorites too. To our eyes, that would look more gray yes at depth it would look more gray yeah. but who knows what it would look like to other fish because right. they see colors in ways that are different from our vision right i don't know yes. a whole lot about butterfly fish vision but generally speaking sea creatures many of them see what what we cannot see yes see colors in some ways that are adapted to our <laughs> normal habitat, which yeah. is right, right. Sort of sea light. Oh, oh goodness, gorgeous. Goodness. Yeah, this is another one from the Red Sea, Kitadon uh, Lunilatus, and another one that has uh, both the pattern and the colors just strike me as, as completely stunning. And this is the best. I, I think I have, I don't know, 100 photos of these species. Because every time I do a dive in the Red Sea, I have to take a picture of it. I can't swim oh, by it and not take a picture yeah. of it. And this is, I think this is the best photo I've had of it. He he's, looks like an embarrassed fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Blushing. Yeah. <laughs> but again, no eye stripe. Look. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wonder how they look to one another. Yeah. That's I think one of its common names is the masked butterfly fish because of the, the, the shape of the, the mark in the face, too. Oh, well, but yeah, the eye is definitely not hidden on this one. But the key is when we photograph them with artificial light, it doesn't tell the true story of how they see each other or one Absolutely. another. And it would be very... God, it's, there's so much to learn about these. Yeah. How they, what what does color mean to them? Right, right. Yeah. Not only the, the light is different on the water, but also their vision is different. The, the, the right. eye, uh, yeah, the, the, the way they, they see light is also different. So you have to crack at both sides, right? You have to look at how they look like at those depths and how they look like to their same species and how they look like to different species. We also don't know what, what they look like to a predator. So... It's right. So many questions. You can spend a, a lifetime just on on one species trying to figure out those things. Yeah. Oh, look, oh, at, this look at this yeah. guy. This is my absolute favorite. Uh, that's the only picture, by the way. The entire uh, it's it's sad because it's my favorite butterfly fish, and I've never seen it underwater. Um, hmm. I have a yeah. thing with with cold water. I I don't have a problem when the cold water is is deep, but I have a problem when cold water is shallow because the entire <laughs> I know that I'm going to be cold the entire dive. <laughs> and this particular species is from Japan, where the water is cold, and the entire water column is the route iron butterfly fish, Kitodon diadoma. But I think the, the color of it is just unbelievably nice. I've, yeah, yeah, it's oh. the most striking butterfly fish in, in the world, I think. It's like each scale has been hand painted. Right. It's and so the, the detail of the yellow around the, the, the mm -hmm. tail is just amazing. Absolutely beautiful. Interesting. And look at the eye. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> and that was it. Um, I just put that slide there to say that here at Cal Academy, we have an initiative called Hope for Reefs. Um, I think Gigi is going to put a link in the chat there. And um, uh, it's an initiative that we have to kind of help reefs. I mean, reefs need help. Um, so we're trying to do everything we can to to protect and, and generate knowledge that can be used to protect reefs worldwide here at the Academy. And this, this project kind of focuses on that. Well, one of the things I love about what you're doing, Luis, is reefs go deep. Yeah. yeah. Most of what is known about reefs are within the convenient depth of scuba, down to 30 meters or so, maybe a bit deeper, but with a new 
use of rebreathers, you're doubling that depth and more than that, than that in some cases. And then there's what's below that. I wonder, do you have some idea of the maximum depth that butterfly fish can go or do go? I think we have records of some species of some genera and some groups going to about 200 meters. So that's 600 feet. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's anything deeper than that. Uh, there's other groups of fishes that kind of look like butterfly fish and occur in hard bottom, so in, in consolidated substrate deeper than that. But butterfly fishes, the family Chetodontidae, they're more or less restricted to reefs and more or less to this depth range between 150, 200 meters. But everything can change with more exploration, right? So, Right, and with some going to where the temperature is 13, 15 degrees centigrade, yeah, that temperature alone may not be as limiting a factor as perhaps other elements that link them directly to coral reefs. Yes, I think they're really visual. Uh, they're really visual predators. They have to see their prey moving. So below 200 meters, all of the light disappears and they they, they can't find, I think they can't find their, they, they don't they didn't develop a, a system to eat when there's no, there's no light. Yeah. Unless, unless they're bioluminescent. <laughs> unless they're bioluminescent, yes, yeah. There is that, yeah. <laughs> Let's jump in with a few questions that we have uh, here. Oh, great. Right. Um, Sky is asking, what was your most favorite experience in the field? Ooh, that's, that's, that's a hot hard. hour after the cold dies. <laughs> yeah. That is a hard question. That's a hard question. Um, I think I think it's actually the, the first minute of the first dive. In, in especially in, in um, some of my more recent trips uh, with the rebreather diving and tactical diving, there's so much logistics that we have to prepare. It's it's weeks of preparation and anticipation and everything builds up, everything builds up. And then you get to the first dive and you, you put, in some cases, my gear weighs more than me. So I, I, I weigh 160 pounds. And when I put all of my gear together, it's like 200, 210 pounds. Um, and then I have all of that gear and I jump in the water and, and we start going down and I see this reef and I'm like, yeah, that's, yeah. that's why I do it. Yes. This is why, yeah. Um, yeah. so it's like frustration and, and preparation and, and anxiety. And then the first minute is oh, just bliss. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I enjoy that a lot. All right. Stephanie is asking, Sylvia always says fish have their own personalities. What kind of personality personalities have you observed in butterfly fish? That's that's another good question. I think that the, the in terms of behavior, the thing that catches everybody's attention always is how how close the pair goes when they when they swim in pairs. When they're they're a mated pair, they're always following one another, and then you can almost notice one looking for another. When as divers if, trying to take pictures, and we get too close to them, sometimes they they get scared and they'll separate from each other, and you see that they're looking for each other. Where is it? Where yeah. is it? They find themselves and go and take off. Where are um, you? But there's yeah exactly there's that always the the where is it where's my pair where's my pair where yeah. is it? so they're concerned yeah they're kind of like concerned look mm -hmm. you could almost say that they're where's my buddy where's my buddy yes, exactly kind of like scuba divers right like where's my buddy where's this one you know she's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so where'd no. she go oh she's looking she's over there she's looking she's at that algae yeah <laughs> angelfish I've seen the the pairs of angelfish cruising around they, like that and sometimes if they get separated yeah it takes a while, but then they come back together again and yeah, yeah. and you've even seen some fishes that that uh you know they one of them gets in trouble or they get hung up in a piece of fishing line or whatever and the the mate won't leave you know they yeah, stay there and, there and try to you know trying to do what they can to support or Hopefully, get a diver to come and cut them, cut yeah. them away from that yeah. line. So. Butterfly fish do that. We see them in the Caribbean where they fish a lot with traps. Oh. Um, if there's oh. one inside the trap, we see the other one oh. outside the trap very often. Oh. Yeah. yeah. When I see that, I kind of let them go because Thank they, you. even if they sometimes they catch them in the trap, um, yeah. but they don't do anything with it. They're so small that um, um, bycatch. Yeah, bycatch exactly. Nobody eats them. Carl Sapina calls it by kill by kill yeah. it is, exactly yeah. so yeah that must be that must be just so grim to see the one sort of frantically going around the outside of the trap going can't get in the other one can't yeah. get out so thank yeah, you for this 
<laughs> yeah, fish link shoot too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Jean is asking, there's a big commercial aquarium trade in butterfly fish. Has this led to some species becoming uh, invasive? Hmm. It has led to some introductions, but not species becoming invasive. Not, not in case of butterfly fish, mostly because they're very, they're very strict. They're very tricky about their diet, so they don't spread easily. Um, I know there's a few Indo-Pacific species that have been seen in Florida, where it's one of the biggest trades that receives uh, uh, imported species. And when people have those butterfly fish in their tanks, if they move and they get rid of the tank, or if the fish becomes too big to the tank, they don't want to kill the fish, so they just release it in the ocean. And by releasing it in the ocean, inadvertently, they're, they're um, um, introducing species, right? There's something interesting that happened in Florida after the movie Nemo. A lot oh. of species were seen in Florida that were non-native because people released their fish after the movie, which is a nice thing. But then if you have to do it in the right place, right? You can't be like yeah. really anywhere. Yeah. Um, but butterfly fish in general, they haven't become invasive. The biggest uh, invasive species we have in the Atlantic and in the ocean in general is the lionfish, which right. is also an aquarium fish. And it was also introduced uh, through the aquarium trade through, uh, through Florida. Yeah. And those guys are very opportunistic in their feeding. They'll they'll eat anything that'll fit in their mouth. And exactly, uh, but those butterfly fish seem like they're such specialists. Those little mm -hmm. mouth parts, or you know, that they they really require um, so things that they like to eat. Have butterfly fish been successfully raised in captivity? They have not. Um, it's it's really hard to breed them. They they require very specific conditions. And the, the trade for them has been steadily declining. Um, in the beginning, I would say 30 years ago, when there was like really this, this boom in, in technology that allowed people to have marine, freshwater fish is a lot easier to maintain. Marine tank requires a lot more technology, knowing your system, especially if you want to keep corals alive, which is like the thing that everybody wants to do now is to have live corals in their tank. So people in general don't keep butterfly fish for two reasons. One, because they eat the coral. <laughs> uh, and they don't want to put a fish that's going to eat their, their prized coral, which is invariably the hardest thing to, to keep. Um, uh, but also because they eat the coral, they're hard to feed with anything else. So even if you don't have live coral in your tank, it's very hard to keep them happy mm -hmm. and, and, and satisfied if you don't have, if you don't provide the right food, which is coral. Um, so in the beginning, 30 or 40 years ago, it was quite common to see butterfly fish in the aquarium trade, but... Um, I think that the, the trade itself that matured and people learned both the aquarists and the, the shops, they learned that they, the shop, it's not in the interest of the shop to sell a fish to an aquarist that is, it's, the fish is going to die in six months because it doesn't have the proper diet. So right. they stopped selling it. So it, it's very hard to find butterfly fish for sale now because there's very few of them that you can feed successfully in, in, in an aquarium. And, um, they only sell it they really ask you what kind of size of tank do you have um, yeah. do you really know how to keep your fish so the, the the aquarium trade if you if you're in the right place you go to the right shop which most of them at least here in california are are doing that they are trying to responsibly sell their their um their fish yeah yeah, I mean, they care weird. they care about them and they know how yeah so but because the, there's not a high volume uh, trade in butterfly fish that hasn't been much of a push to try to breed them in captivity so that's the answer to your question there why they haven't been bred it's not i mean they're hard but they're not much harder than angelfish and some angelfish are being bred um yeah. and the, the difference is that angelfish are much much easier to maintain in an aquarium so there is a trade to angelfish so there's a, an incentive to try to breed them in captivity so now quite a few species of angelfish are bred in captivity but not butterfly fish because they know that even if they breed them most aquarists are gonna not going to have the, the knowledge to 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 keep them, and nobody wants to buy a fish every every few months, right? To, to no, have it just, their aquarium. Sad, yeah. you, you hope you hope that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and when I've seen sort of the little butterfly fish in, you know, sometimes restaurants have a fish tank, yeah, or whatever. It's only one. Yeah, and species that typically have pairs that mm -hmm. are. We wonder. It's sad. Captured in the wild and somebody's wondering, where'd you go? Yeah. 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 Abducted yeah. by 
Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's usually the generalist species. So the species that have that wide distribution that, that feed on everything. So those are the only the few that can be successfully maintained in, in captivity. But the, I think the top, my top five there that I showed, only one, the route iron butterfly fish is the one that's actually relatively easy to maintain in, in captivity, but it's the most expensive one you can get. Yeah. Um, not because it's rare in particular, but because the, the islands where it's found in Japan, they're very remote and they have a really large protected area that don't allow any fishing. So if you go to the place where they live, they're super common, but um, they're off limits. So yeah. when people collect them, it's in mainland Japan where they appear only once every two years. It's as a vagrant. Um, so because there's so few of them that make it to mainland, then when they, they show up in the trade, they, they, it's really expensive, three or $4,000 for, wow. for a fish. And then yeah. the only people that buy them are the people that know that can keep them alive for, uh, the real for the lifetime of the species, not for just a few months. I mean, not, and the beginning aquarist is never going to pay that much for an acquiring fish. So. No, no yeah. they're like, give me the goldfish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, the price for some of these aquarium trade fishes is such that you know pound for pound they're the most expensive <laughs> you think they'd be they the most, are. The most profitable in aquaculture yeah right? so we have the most expensive one of all we have it here at the academy the peppermint angelfish oh, um, wow. which is one that we collected our team collected diving deep with the rebreeders in uh in french polynesia uh, mm -hmm. at about 400 feet so 120 yeah. 130 meters and that's that's why it's so expensive because you have to go really deep to see it um, but when you get to the right habitat, they are, they're very common there, but they're very beautiful. I think the most beautiful angel fish in the world. And then they happen to be the most expensive marine acquiring fish in the world. So if you're bringing them back from the wild, they're not cultivated in aquaculture. They have a swim bladder problem too, don't they? Yeah, we have, um, um, so usually how, uh, when people collect fish for the aquarium trade, what they do is they, they do a mini surgery. They poke, they have a needle, they poke the fish they, they, to release the pressure from the gas. But we developed here at the Academy because we don't, don't want to poke the needle to cause infections or anything like that. We developed the decompression chamber for the fish. <laughs> fish More compression humane. chamber, yes. Yes, so we have a decompression chamber for the fish. We put them in the chamber and uh, for the divers, when they go to those depths, we spend a few hours decompressing. For the fish, they spend days inside this decompression chamber decompressing like the, the pressure goes down by one foot at a time very very slowly and we can feed them through the system so it's it's a yeah it's a really long process to decompress them and uh when we have them here at the exhibit they because we decompress them properly without the needles or anything they live a really long time so most of the fish it was very fortunate for me though because when we opened this exhibit we had a budget to go back to the field several times to collect more fish because we didn't know how long the fish were going to live. And the fish lived so long that I ended up using all of the budget from my science because Excellent. we didn't know to, we didn't need to go back to collect more live fish because That's the good. ones we have, they, they're been living happily here for a, a long, long time. That's and excellent. we had a pair of, a pair of those angel fish here. So great. All right. Let's jump back to some more questions. Yeah. Emily is asking, do fish see in color? Some species do. Some species see UV even. Denso fish, which we talked about too, they, they see UV. So they have UV patterns and they have UV vision because they're shallow. UV doesn't penetrate very deep either. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, they see color. They see it differently than us though. Mantis shrimp it is the one that has the most oh, yeah. amazing vision though. Yeah, that one's mind-blowing. Amazing. Mind-blowing. Yeah. Uh, Emily is asking, uh, I read that wearing yellow when scuba diving will repel a shark. Is that huh. accurate? And if so, does it explain why so many butterfly fish are yellow in color, given that some butterfly fish remove dead skin and parasites from a shark? I was really curious about that. Yeah. So first of all, why would you ever want to repel a shark? No, that's right. <laughs> like, come on, boy. <laughs> exactly. I think it's the most, yeah. I think a shark repellent is going with a loaded camera trying to take pictures of sharks. Yeah, because then they're like, oh, you know. <laughs> that's that's uh, i think one of the luckiest moments in every dive i say is when i see a shark is when i'm most excited um this last trip i did to the maldives i saw six species of shark in one dive it's, it's my record by a long shot and i was so happy about it i saw a the tiger shark going down i saw a, a, a 
zebra shark coming up, which was the first time I saw. And then I saw a bunch of reef sharks, like a gray reef, a black tip, a white tip, and the nurse shark, all in the same dive. And it was amazing. So don't repel the shark. They, they by and large, they don't, they won't do anything to you. Um, yeah. I don't think yellow repels them. Um, uh, I don't think those, you see online, like, uh, there's a thing that you can wrap to your your elbow or your leg that produces an electric current that re they say repels them. I don't think it repels them either. Um, but I wouldn't want to repel them. I want them to climb close to me so I can take pictures. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're... But if you're a little tiny fish, you might wish to repel a shark. Yes, if you're a little tiny fish, in the case of most reef fish, they, they just go close to the reef. So yeah. if they go close to the reef, the shark can get close to the reef. They don't get to them. But um, I don't think the 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 most sharks, unless it's a reef shark, most sharks don't feed on, on reef fish anyways. Um, nurse sharks will feed on reef fish and, and white tip sharks, but they feed at night. They they kind of feed where they, 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 they don't really pay attention to the color of the fish. They're more interested in the fish that's easy to catch. So right. if there's a fish that is sick or if there's a fish that is hurt and... Then they they notice by the the noise the fish makes the way they swim they they just go for the easy prey because it's it's less energy for them. Right. Or the white tips in Cocos Island that feed at night they'll feed they'll just yeah. get anybody they can catch. That's, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's why the parrotfish makes those big mucusy cocoons because yeah. they must taste terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, could be. They're toxic for some species too. The cocoons. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Robert is asking, since red disappears in shallow water, why are deep sea fishes red? That is a, a question that I get a lot when I do my deep diving talk, which is not necessarily this one. Um, and it's still a question we're trying to answer. Part of it is what Sylvia said. We don't know what they see, um, but we don't know if those colors are masking some fluorescence. We don't know if they're really, if they can see red differently. Um, uh, we also don't know, it can be camouflage because yeah. the light is not there. So it's not reflecting anything. If they don't move, they might look kind of invisible because they're, they're not reflecting anything. So yeah. it's a number of different competing hypotheses that are out there. And we don't exactly know what, I don't think really it's camouflage because a lot of the species that are red at depth are anteas and the anteas, they always look different between the male and the female. Um, even though they are red and yellow and all of those warm colors that don't penetrate very deep, they look different. So if if the intent was camouflage, they shouldn't look different, right? So yeah, um, yeah. I think um, I think there's something to it. It's it's still an open question. We need to spend more time down there and see. <laughs> yeah, you have to be a fish to see what a fish sees. All yeah. right, two more questions. Robert is asking, after all these years. How does Sylvia maintain her obvious level of interest and excitement? Oh, why not? I think you just, it's just curiosity has not been quashed in her like <laughs> it is in so many people. You know, you, you, we always say, remain curious, living proof. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I know it can be um, uh, depressing, if, 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 especially if you study reefs and you can see the decline within our lifetimes, for sure, we can see the decline. Oh, yeah. We can never lose hope, and there's always no, more always interesting questions to to study. Yeah, I I agree, and especially as we build the case for more protected areas, and we get mm -hmm. more people diving, and and have things like you know your beautiful photographs show them like what's at stake. People start to care. And Sylvia always says, "With knowing comes caring." So uh, when mm -hmm. we start to caring, to, there's hope. Caring, there's hope. But back to the question of how do you maintain enthusiasm why should you ever <laughs> lose it exactly my mouth sometimes how do you get to be a scientist like i i claim that this is the recipe you start out as a little kid and you do what little kids do which is you ask questions who what why where when why and especially why not mm -hmm. never grow up just you know scientists are, are like little kids you're certainly in that category, Luis. I agree 100%. I think the, the questions just become more complex, but it's just as fun to ask them than, than it was 40, 50 years ago, yeah. Yeah. What, what it appalls me is when people say, oh, I'm bored, I don't know what to do. Oh my Lord, smack, mm. you know. <laughs> Give me your time. Yeah. We'll find something to do. 
Okay, we got a few more questions that have popped in here. Uh, Sherry says, I was diving in Curacao last week and I saw a huge school of bleach or huge areas of bleaching and die off mm -hmm. and a very few butterfly fish compared to just six months earlier. My mm -hmm. question is, how far do the butterfly fish swim to find live coral or do they just die off? Good question. It, yeah, it depends on the species. Um, most of the Caribbean species, I think all of the Caribbean species, none of the Caribbean species rely on live coral. Um, so they, they, they swim quite far to, to find suitable habitat. Um, the problem recently is that these die-offs are, are becoming bigger and bigger. So yeah. it's not unheard of that the die-off is, is half of an island. So if you're a butterfly fish that you're stuck in the middle of the area where the die-off is happening, you're probably going to starve before you find a new, uh, better habitat. Um, and if you rely on, on really live coral, the coral that is dying in the Caribbean now, there's a disease called stony tissue, uh, oh, stony yeah. coral tissue loss disease. And that is devastating pillar coral, for example, and quite a few other species. So if you're a species that rely on those species, those species of coral being alive, then it, it's really hard to survive after that, a, a die off like that. Yeah. Goes by. Yeah. That's a, that's a really sad one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We got, we got, we're at the top of the hour. We're going to try to knock off these two other questions. Uh, the first one, oh my God, there's another one. <laughs> uh, Luis, do you have an online gallery of your expeditions or um, species we can find? I do not. A lot of my a lot of my photos are in the in the academy website. I think my best gallery is Instagram. I keep posting my pictures on Instagram all the time. Uh, Put your Instagram in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put my Instagram on the chat. It's easy to find. Coral reef fish. One word. Coral reef fish. Okay. That's sweet. There we go. And then the last one we're going to take today is, uh, has anyone studied the eyes to understand if, if and how fish see color? Not of butterfly fish. There's some species that people have studied, but as far as I know, not of butterfly fish, um, which is an interesting group because they have this diversity of color. So you can compare the color of the species that is gray, for example, with another one that is super colorful. And then you 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 see if they see, at least you can ask if they have anything different. Yeah. Um, I don't think for butterfly fish, I think there's been a lot of study done about their diets and, and their relationship with the coral, which is what is affecting their, their survival right now. But um, vision, I can't remember a lot being done with butterfly fish. But the phenomenon of biofluorescence that is not really visible to us, but maybe to fish and other creatures. Mm -hmm. um, David Gruber's one of one of the researchers. And his turtles pictures. Yeah, looking things, yeah. at the yeah. new way to see the ocean. Right. Hopefully. Yeah, I know Gruber's biofluorescence, Rass's biofluorescence. I don't know about butterfly fish. I don't remember, but uh, that's that's a good question. Yeah, so they might have some fluorescent pigment behind the behind the already amazing patterns they had. So yeah, yeah, we'll see what they we'll see what comes next. Exactly. All right, so we are uh, a little past the top of the hour, so we have to sign off for today. But we really want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. And thank you, Ocean Elders, for hosting us. And thank everyone in the community who keeps we're showing get, up and diving in with us. We're going to get you back. we got to talk about other coral Other reef. fish. Yes, I have. Fish. My, photo, my photo library here is, has 65,000 photos in it. Most of it, like 99% are reef fish. So <laughs> I right, have a lot of material. We have many, many episodes to come then. Nice. Very good. Remind everyone that water connects us all. And we're so incredibly grateful to you. We will be back next week this time. And until then, take care of the ocean as if your life depends on it. Because it does. It does. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone. We'll see you next time. <laughs>